Father God, thank you. We lift up our Easter service to you, which is coming up next week, that people would come, the people, the, the Christers, as we call them, the Christmas and Easter people would come, and they would hear the gospel in a way that they hadn't heard it before, that you would get to their hearts if they don't know you or if they're fooling around with you, if they just think that if they come twice a year, it makes grandma happy, so you might as well be happy and they're good with you or they don't even care to be, but you would get through to their hearts and reach them and let them know that not only do they need a savior, but you are that savior. And, and it's because you love them that you did all this. It's not a duty. It's not a guilt trip. It's just love. Lord, we lift up the Dennis Agajanian concert to you that people would come to that too, feel the same thing, experience the amazing talent you've bestowed this man with, but you've done it because he will glorify you with it. And I pray that you be glorified in that concert. We lift up this track ministry that people will reach for you. Uh, kids, I know I, I showed them to one man who deals with, uh, he was in prison himself, and now he deals with people either in prison or getting out of prison and, and helping to house them and put them back into normal society to be good, responsible citizens and Christians. And he wants a bunch of those tracks because he thinks they're wonderful because they're just simple and explain things. So just pray for your blessing upon that. It has your word in it, so that's going to make it blessed right there. But pray that it be presented in a way that would reach people today for you, for the kingdom. We also lift up Pastor Saeed to you because that's what his desire is too, that people be reached. But I know part of him has to be desiring to come home. So we pray for your protection on him until you bring him home, but we also pray that you would do that. You would have him released. With these talks between the United States and Iran, we've been saying this over and over, Lord. We don't depend on those, but we know that you could use them to help bring him home. So if that's your plan, we ask that you do it. But whatever it is, we just are asking, please, could he come home? And then the other please is, please show us what you have for us today from the Bible. We want to learn about you. We want to know more. Than we came in, than we knew when we came in the door. Thanks, God, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So, we're picking this up in uh, verse twenty of chapter seventeen. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, "The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you." Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of the one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation." I went back and forth before I even uh, started studying this about whether or not I should teach on Palm Sunday, because that's what today is. I don't know if you mentioned that. Or if, I don't know if you mentioned it when you came in the door. I don't know if you realized that when you came to church today, but that's the day that Jesus rode in on the donkey in Jerusalem and was presented as king. First time he allowed them to present him as king, what he was basically doing is presenting himself for inspection to find any sin, any blemish, which is what they did with the animals, and none was found. In fact, what they accused him of, he eventually agreed and said, yes, I am the son of God. That was his only crime. Well, that's the truth. So anyway, I, didn't, I chose not to go over that because as I looked at this, I realized there's an awful lot of what he stood for and what he did that has to do with his being in trouble on Palm Sunday. And it mentioned in this passage and at the last verse that's talking about suffering kind of ties in with Good Friday too. So I figured it would be a good section to segue into Easter next week. So that's what we're going to do. So verse 20, I call this, by the way, this message, speaking of my return, dot, dot, dot. Verse 20, now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. So the, first of all, this is an important thing to know. The Pharisees this question they asked, it was a legitimate question for them to ask. When is the kingdom of God going to come? He's been talking about it a lot, so they want to know. Because in Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, Jesus tells us why this is a legitimate question. He said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. 
So in other words, he's saying, hey, they are in the authority seat. Whatever they tell you to do based on what Moses said, what I, what, he didn't say what I told Moses, what God told Moses to write down in the law, whatever they told, God told them to write down and, and to observe, when they tell you that, do it. Then he continued, though, he says, but do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. <laughs> in other words, do as they say, not as they do, because they'll tell you the truth, but they won't do it, act it out. So that's a dangerous problem, obviously, dealing with them. But they were put there in authority, and Jesus is saying they have that authority, so they had the authority to ask him. They were the custodians of the law, the keepers of it, meaning they were to study it, to understand it, and then to dispense the meanings to the people. So studying, understanding, and dispensing. Their only mistake they made was, unfortunately for them, a very big one. <laughs> they didn't obey it themselves. That was a problem. But they had the right to ask Jesus when he thought the kingdom of God would appear. You see, it was typical for Jewish teachers to discuss these subjects in public, so they asked him for an answer in public. There's another reason why they were so excited, and that is Passover was near. And Jewish nationalism always ran high during the Passover, kind of like patriotism in this country gets high on the 4th of July, right? We kind of think about that. And now, unfortunately, in our recent memories with 9-11, we kind of get patriotic. I remember the first time after the real 9-11 in 2001, the first time I saw a plane fly overhead, because if you remember, they shut down air flight. Everything was done. And when the first time I saw one, I actually welled up with tears. I did. I thought, wow, things are getting a little bit back to normal. We're we're America. We're coming back. <laughs> you know, I had this nationalism, and the Jews feel a lot of nationalism during the Passover. What they'd be celebrating is their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. They were in slavery hundreds of years, and finally, they're going to be delivered. And they got delivered, and they celebrate that. So deliverance from bondage to Rome, which hadn't happened yet, was also on their minds. But there's one more thing going on here, and it's something that is not according to the plan of God. Because, see, the Pharisees, scribes, and elders studied the scriptures. They knew all about the coming Messiah. They knew all about the coming, powerful, conquering, ruling Messiah. Yeah, that's the one they wanted. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. That sounds awesome. This guy is going to come from God, and he's going to be the man. He's going to be in charge, and he's going to be in charge of the government. And government and his peace, there will be no end to it. Upon the throne of David, one of their heroes promised the ruler, the Messiah, would come and sit on the throne of David. And the, this section of Isaiah is saying that's going to happen. And over his kingdom, to David's kingdom, in charge of that too, to order it and establish it, to set it in order and set it up. With what? Judgment, justice, and the American way. No, that was Superman, right? From that time forward, so as soon as he comes and sets it up, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God himself will make sure this gets done. This is the guy they were looking for. Isaiah 16, 5. It, in mercy, the throne will be established. The one will sit on it in truth in the tabernacle of David, so he'll be ruling from the temple judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. They would love that, justice and hastening righteousness. Things are not righteous with them right now, and they're not feeling justice is going on when the Romans are ruling with what? That iron fist. The way Rome ruled was anybody says no, wham, they just crush them. That's why that great image has the iron involved in it, in, in Daniel, because Rome is just boom. It wasn't my way or the highway. It was my way or <laughs> they didn't even want you to go away. They just crush you. Crucifixions happened a lot of times along the road into cities and out of cities. So you'd go by and see that and you'd read the crime and say, okay, I don't want to commit that because I don't want to be that guy. Okay? I mean, they were just brutal. Micah 5.2, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah... 
talking about Jesus' birth, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. This has been a long time coming and it's going to last forever and he will be the man. This is their champion. This is the one to get rid of the hated Romans. Whether it's Jesus Christ to them or someone else, it doesn't matter. Because remember what Isaiah 9, 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Once the Messiah takes charge, it's permanent. I love that. They were so ready for him to come. The religious establishment of that day was looking for a visible, material, worldly kingdom. Even the common people knew quite a bit about it. That's why when Jesus rode in, I, I, I knew that Palm Sunday would work its way in. So when he rode in and they were saying, Hosanna, which means save now. They were hoping he'd ride in there and just boom, take control, be the man. They expected their Messiah to be militant, one who would not only kick out the Romans, but also rule from Jerusalem. And of course, they would get to be his officers of the court. <laughs> That's not a bad job to have. We're rulers now. We've been waiting for you. We're here. We kind of help set things up. Can we stay and help you run the place? For over three years, Jesus has been preaching about the kingdom of God. Jesus was called the Christ by many, and popular opinion of that day was that the Christ would be a political leader. So even though the Pharisees didn't like Jesus, perhaps he would deliver them. We know from many places in the Gospels, they wanted him dead. But now they see there's public opinion that's swelling in his favor. Maybe he could be the guy. These Pharisees could have hoped he would succeed. If he did, he'd be better than having the Romans in charge. He's just got to be better than that. And if he failed in his attempt, then it, it would result in his death. So either way, they figured they'd be better off. Either he's going to make it and be the one in charge, or he's going to fail and die. Now, he would die, and in that death, deliver them, just not the way they expected. So that was the first way, first Messiah the, or not the first Messiah, but the Messiah that they saw in Scripture, this big, bad dude going to come in worse than, tougher than bad, bad Leroy Brown. If you remember that old song from Jim Croce, baddest man in the whole uh, darn town. <laughs> Badder than old King Kong and meaner than, you know what, a junkyard dog. So they thought he was just going to come in and take charge. Now, they also knew from the Scriptures that it's, they spoke at length about a suffering Messiah. Isaiah 53, verse 3, he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Now, that doesn't sound like a powerful, conquering, ruling Messiah. Do you want your king always being beaten on, always suffering, always being so acquainted with grief? I mean, he personally keeps Kleenex in business <laughs> because of the constant tears and the constant using him to dry his eyes? No, of course not. Isaiah 53, 7, going on. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He's not too powerful if he just takes it all lying down and never says anything, never defends himself. That's what possibly would be running through their minds. Psalm 22, 14 through 18, which, by the way, is a prophetic psalm. So much of it is about crucifixion, which wasn't invented for hundreds of years. But God knew about it, so we had David write this. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. That's one of the things that happens with crucifixion. Your, your bones go out of joint when they uh, stretch you out across and nail you in, most likely again through the wrists, into the wood, and you're hanging there, joints come apart. It's just common. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. And we know from studies that doctors have done that the heart basically, that fluid builds up around it, and that's why the blood and water came out when they stabbed the spear in, because he basically died of a broken heart or heart attack, you know, and suffocation in that combined. 
My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. Dehydration is terrible during crucifixion. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. We know that many people who hated him were at the crucifixion. You know, the Jews, who they said they shoot out the lip and shake their head and say, hey, you know, he saved so many others. Why doesn't he save himself? Here's one that's amazing. They pierced my hands and my feet. That was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was invented. Now, what happened in the crucifixion? They pierced your hands, which the wrist is considered part of the hand, especially in Greek, and his feet. Word for word, what happened? I can count all my bones. Have you ever had that kind of flu where your bones ache? You know where every bone is. You didn't realize you had a bone. <laughs> He's in tremendous pain. They look and stare at me. And listen to this, too, what the soldiers did. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. It's amazing. It's exactly what happened. Remember, they, they took his robe, and they said, well, well, we'll cast lots in this and this. He goes, oh, we can't divide this up, though. This is too nice. We don't want to tear it. So let's just gamble for it. That's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. But does this sound like what would happen to a big, mighty, conquering king who's going to rule forever, and yet how can he do that when he's gone through this? The Pharisees clearly understood that Scripture spoke of a conquering Messiah, and they liked that a lot. But they also understood that the scripture spoke of a suffering Messiah who would eventually die. They didn't like that as much, but they couldn't deny it. It's there. But like a lot of us, they also had difficulty understanding certain sections of scripture. See, we have an overwhelming advantage over them. We have the perspective given to us by the complete book we call the Bible. <laughs> the Old Testament, the New Testament, we have been blessed with 2,000 years worth of Bible teachers, including the apostles themselves, Jesus himself. We have commentators, we have pastors, even personal study time. And we have the advantage of the Holy Spirit living inside us to personally lead us in the understanding and the application of Scripture in our daily devotionals. <laughs> we just have that advantage. Now, for all the Pharisees did wrong... They did look into scriptures a lot. And they had a really hard time wrapping this concept around their brains. How could a Messiah suffer and die and then rule? It just doesn't make sense. It was too much for them to understand. So just like a lot of us do, they interpreted it in their own way. And they came to a conclusion. They decided that scripture was describing not one Messiah, but two. Two separate Messiahs. One to suffer and one to conquer. They wanted Jesus to be that conquering Messiah. At least they hoped he would be because anything they thought would be better than the Romans. They really, really hated the Romans. Have I said that enough? Are you getting the idea? <laughs> they just couldn't stand them. They wanted the Romans defeated and run out of Israel. They desired this so much that right here, they wanted Jesus to give them a date as to when he would start the revolution. When is this going down? They wanted Jesus to take charge or get out of the way. So, the Pharisees have asked him this question, when is the kingdom of God going to come? The rest of verse 20, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Now, since Jesus is saying this is not the way the kingdom of God comes, we have to understand what the word observation means. Now, observation means in such a manner that it can be watched with the eyes with outward show. Now, that seems pretty obvious, right? It's not really a deep meaning. But it also has the idea of spying, of lying in wait, and even scientific investigation. It's also used to describe what a medical doctor will do with a patient whom he suspects has a disease, and he's watching for symptoms of that disease to appear. So we're watching very closely. I had knee surgery. I've talked about it before. I think it was like, let's see, 95, 45, over 20 years ago. And when I was discharged from the hospital, I was given a prescription for pain pills to take, and I needed them. And after I took the first pill, I broke out in like hives all over, itchy, and it was really irritating. So my wife called the doctor right away. He said, don't let them take any more, and I'll prescribe a different one. I wish I remember what that was because they would put it on my list when they say, are you allergic to anything? I would say, yeah, that one. 
<laughs> I don't remember what it was. But anyway, um, I took another, took the one that he prescribed after that, and then I was fine. But that was an outward sign easily seen by anyone. The point Jesus made here was that God's kingdom would not come with great outward show so that people could predict its arrival and chart its progress. Like, you know, you got the guy with the clipboard, and he's saying, okay, this has happened, and this has happened, and this has happened. It's going to be tomorrow, <laughs> or something like that. God would bring forth his plan in his way. Besides, the kingdom Jesus is describing is a radical way of thinking. Jesus came to bring change, which the Pharisees wanted. But the change Jesus was bringing was not an outward change, but inward change. You see, outward change doesn't work its way inward, but inward change always works its way outward. It just can't help it. You change on the inside, you're going to be different on the outside. You change on the outside, you're still the same on the inside quite a bit. You're just kind of faking it. That's why Jesus said the Pharisees were what? Whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. And, of course, anything dead was unclean, so he was really indicting them. In verse 21, Jesus says, Nor will they say, see here or see there. Now, why would Jesus say this? That sounds like an interesting thing. Because the Pharisees were looking for an outward sign as to the coming of the kingdom. And the type of change Jesus meant was an inward type, unseen. Now, I put this here, unseen by many. And by that, I mean this. People who know you know when you get saved, there's a change. You're different. Okay, but not everybody will know because not everybody will know you personally. Not everyone will know you day by day and see the change happening to you. But most of the time, most people can't see that, but a lot of people can. So telling people to look here or look, look there probably won't work. Now, the next statement of Jesus, I believe, is going to blow him away because he says, for indeed, the kingdom of God is within you and they're thinking he's going to rule he's going to write is within us what is he saying but that's why they couldn't see it it's on the inside now there are two possible meanings here the first one is the most obvious at least obvious to us and that's this the kingdom of god comes to us on the inside in the heart every believer in jesus christ as savior and lord has jesus living in them you invite him to come into your heart in the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul gave us a good explanation-type definition of this. In his explanation of how we shouldn't grieve others and other believers by what we eat or drink. Something so simple as that. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, Paul was saying that there are some people that are free to eat all foods. It doesn't matter what the food is, what's happened to it. They're thankful, they're grateful, and then they eat it or drink it. It's no problem. Other people have problems with certain things, and it's because of their convictions. So Paul said this, while these two different opinions and types are together, those who are free to eat anything must not eat what the other one wouldn't eat, because of the love of Jesus in their hearts. You understanding this? You getting this? This is what it means. I'm free to eat this. I have no problem. But I choose not to eat it in front of you because I love you in Christ and I would never want to choose to do anything to stumble you in your faith. That would be rude and mean. Only an inward change of heart can do this. Otherwise, you'd say, well, it's too bad to be you, man. You're really missing out. This is good. <laughs> That's just not right. It's not good. But you know what? You should care. Because the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the spirit. Not eating that food in front of your brother is the righteous thing to do. It will bring peace to the situation, which will mean that joy will be shared by both of you. So that's why we should do it. Inward change. This will show that the kingdom of God is within you. It's not so much visible as it's just going to be manifested by how you act. Now, the Greek word for within you could also be translated in this second way. That's among you. Now, the Pharisees were looking for the kingdom, but they were missing the king in front of them. He was a demonstration of a man submitted to the authority of God. See, the Pharisees were looking for a material kingdom. Jesus was talking about a spiritual kingdom. Totally different thing. Now, in Christianity, now there's going to be a, uh, 
material kingdom. There's going to be a governmental kingdom by Jesus, but he's talking about now the spiritual one goes on. In Christianity, you can't look outward for the kingdom without first inviting the king inward to your heart. So both meanings are true, and it's even possible Jesus meant both of them. He can do that. He's God. We're not. He can mean that the kingdom of God comes to us on the inside in the heart and that the kingdom of God was among them. And unless they believe, that's the closest to the kingdom they'd get. David Guzik has this quote. He says, like many today, the Pharisees said they wanted the kingdom of God to come. But you don't want the kingdom if you reject the king. So now Jesus is finished addressing the the, uh, Pharisees, and he turns and he's addressing his disciples. Jesus addressed the Pharisees about their need for inward change. The disciples have already begun the inward change, so now Jesus addresses the other aspect of his kingdom, his second coming. He starts in verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not be able to see it. Now, Jesus is telling that one day, I think what he's saying is they'll wish for the good old days to return. You know, God, that was fun. Remember when we hung out and we were all freaked out about what we were going to do? There were 5,000 men plus women and children. We had no food. And Jesus said, well, you feed them. Like, (laughs) what? They're not cattle. They're not going to eat the grass. What are we supposed to feed them? What we have, what what, what have you got? We have five loaves of bread and two small fish and then I think it's Philip says but what are, what is that among so many <laughs> and then what happened everybody ate and we had enough baskets left over for each one of us to have a basket full I love stuff like that remember when they tried to catch him with um, the temple tax whether or not Jesus should pay the temple tax and he said well who you know the, who, who has to pay taxes uh, in the kingdom are this do the sons pay taxes no so the sons are free. But just so we don't offend them, Peter, go down there to the lake and cast in your line. When you catch a fish, bring it in, and you'll find a drachma in his mouth, and that'll pay my temple tax and yours. I mean, he just always had the right answer. I wish we had him here. It would be so cool. That's the type of thing that he was saying. They will want things to go back as they were. We can have a danger with that. We can have a nice time in the Lord, and then... God moves us on to something else, and we're like, but I liked that time. I love this example. When you're driving in a car, which is bigger, the windshield where you're going or the rearview mirror where you've been? It's smaller. Where you've been, it's good to know. It's good to see. It's important to know. Maybe a truck's coming up with the brakes broken or something. You know, you need to see that. But it's not as important as where you're headed, and that's where we should be. We should be thinking forward. What we want to, a lot of times, the disciples and and we can do the same thing. We want to relive what is happening, what has happened to them is happening now, but they can't. Or it could be that Jesus is saying they will long for his return after he left them, which is another way of looking at this. You will long for to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Maybe they were just really wanting him to return. If that's the case, I believe there's a warning here as well because they say you will not see it. That could mean Jesus didn't want them to be so caught up looking for his return that they missed out on ministry opportunities right in front of them. You're so concerned and excited about him coming back that you don't do what he has for you to do now. And there's an easy way to, that's an easy thing to do. In fact, we as the church, we must pay attention to this warning and apply it to us as well. We can be so excited about the return of Jesus, that we will only focus on his return. We forget about daily life and ministry here on earth until he does come. Yes, we are to look for his coming. And even being excited about it is okay. I'm excited about him coming back. I think it'd be awesome. I pray all the time for the rapture to happen. Um, I just say, you know, I want to get out of here. One time I looked at my wife. She was going like this. I said, what are you doing? She says, rapture practice. (laughs) getting ready to go we want to go we want to be there so much in fact jesus even promised us that he would come back one of the places john 14 2 and 3 in my father's house are many mansions or dwelling places if it were not so i would have told you i go to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and receive you to myself that where i am there you may be also. I love this promise. Before he left them, he told them he would leave them. 
prepare a place for them to be with him, and then one day come back, return for him. In fact, there was even an angel that told him after he ascended into heaven. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, he ascended into heaven. All the disciples, well, 11, <laughs> anyway, Judas was dead, but they're like, whoa. And so what happens? An angel appears to him and says, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? <laughs> this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So what was the angel saying? Don't just stand there. <laughs> do stuff. He told you to do something, right? Go do it. We know Jesus will come back for us. But when? Ah, that's the question. Would you like to know? I'd like to know too. Well, I can tell you what Jesus said about the timing. That's as far as I'll go. Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. You know, many people throughout history have made many predictions about the exact timing of the return of Jesus Christ. <laughs> they have said so. What part of what Jesus said here don't they understand? No one knows. Oh, asterisk at the bottom, except me. <laughs> it's incredible. I believe the disciples probably thought it was during their lifetimes. Sometime he's going to come back. I really do. If that's the case, it would explain why the New Testament wasn't written until they were much older men when they realized, we better write this stuff down. Because <laughs> he's maybe delaying his coming enough to where we may die off too. But we have no record of any of them predicting a date for the return of Jesus Christ. So I, I would submit this. Let's just leave it at what Jesus said. After all, isn't he the authority? I think so. He said, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, Jesus did tell us about things and signs that are going to happen that will tell us it's the season of his return. And it sure seems like we're seeing a lot of those signs, meaning his return is near. One thing we know for sure, he is coming back, and every day that goes by is one day closer to his return. But now we see another warning from Jesus in 23. And when they say to you, or, and they will say to you, look here or look there. In other words, here's a Messiah. There he is. Do not go after them or follow them. What Jesus is saying here is there will be people who say they know that Jesus has already come back. And only they know where he is. And they are willing to show us where that is. He says, don't believe it. You may remember a man named Charles Manson. He was a leader of a cult in Southern California. He was intent on starting a race war between the blacks and the whites. He also said that he was Jesus Christ. People believed him. It's not true. David Koresh, Jim Jones, Sun Young Moon, and many, 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 many others have all claimed to be Jesus Christ. Right here, Jesus Christ himself tells us not to believe anyone who says they have inside info on the return of Jesus Christ or that they are Jesus Christ themselves. And he goes on to say why other than the fact that he said not to, we shouldn't believe them. Verse 24, for as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. What does that mean? The return of Jesus Christ would be an event so spectacular, so visible, everyone will see it and no one will miss it. You're not going to need help from a watchtower, Bible and Tract Society magazine. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses in case you didn't know that reference. No one will need anyone to tell them about it. Just as lightning is easily seen, even in the daytime, you can see lightning. The return of Jesus Christ will be clearly known. Jesus said so. Has he ever been wrong? No. There's an old quote about the return of Jesus Christ, and I love this. No man will foresee it, and all men will see it. Now Jesus brings it back to a point he's been making recently in 25. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Now, why did Jesus say this at this time? Remember, he's been talking about his return, and he knows we're excited about it, and we should be. But we must never forget that prior to his return, Jesus Christ suffered more than any man in human history. His torturous death had to happen because we have a sin problem. And we do it daily and often. 
We are guilty of sin. Therefore, we shall fall short of God's standard, which is perfection. And that makes us unfit for heaven. But like the wonderful infomercials, but wait, there's more. Jesus knew this, so he came to earth in human form to die a criminal's death in our place. Any sacrifice for sin had to be without blemish. Our sins make us blemished, which means we're disqualified to be our own sacrifice. So Jesus Christ, because of his great love for us and the fact that he was a perfect sacrifice, died for us in our place. He suffered and died for you. So you could spend eternity with him in heaven. All you have to do is believe in him as God and make him your God. John 1 verse 12, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So his suffering and his death were mandatory if we were to be with him in heaven. And he did it gladly. I'll sum it up with this, Hebrews 12 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy of that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He went through the cross because he had joy in his heart and on his mind. The joy he had was your salvation, personally. He went through that tremendous, horrible torture and death with love because he loves you. And then he triumphed, we see that, because he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know if there's a much better time to say this. God is good. And all the time. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for explaining this stuff to us, for talking to us, telling us, reminding us that so though many people will say, hey, there's the Messiah and he's over there, or we know about him and you don't, or he's already come back, he's been here for hundreds of years, but the Bible says that we'll all see it. Well, we saw it with our mind's eye. Where do you get that from? All these people saying so many things because they want to make their point. You've already made your point and you're sticking to it. You've already done it. So much of religion says we have to do. Christianity says it's already done. On the cross, you said it is finished. So we thank you for that, Lord. We do look forward to your coming. We look forward to the day when we get to be with you forever. But you know you have, you know that, but we need to know also that you have things for us to do in the meantime. So though we can be heavenly minded, I think we need to be properly heavenly minded to be earthly good. But we don't want to be so wrapped up in your coming back, so wrapped up in things like that that we don't reach out to others in love, that we don't live the Christian life in the way you want us to, that we don't we aren't being a witness for you. Not only witnessing, but being a witness with our actions. Like the Pharisees, they witnessed, they shared scripture, but you yourself said, don't do what they do. Don't live their, your life the way they live theirs. I pray that that would never be an indictment against us, that yes, they say the truth, but don't watch how they live. But rather, we would live more often than not what you tell us to do. So thanks, God. And we look forward to the great things that you have for us to do until you come back in Jesus' name. Amen.